us and our sound so that they don't see us. <laughs> All right, how am I sounding? Sounding okay out there? Good. And and Don, being that you have the radio background, let me know if I need to go up or down. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Sue. <laughs> if not, you will be with us in spirit. For sure. I see your logos. That's all I see. All right. Good evening, everyone, as we're getting ready and just waiting for everybody to get in. Welcome to tonight's webinar. Keep the light right, too. Do me a favor. Whether you are on zoom in the zoom webinar let us know where you're viewing from and if you're watching this on youtube also drop in the comments where you are tuning in from tonight or if you're watching this on the replay uh, go ahead and just let us know where you are tuning in from city state parish uh good evening good evening good evening go ahead and let's see if who's here in the building today oh we got arizona representing thank you arizona san rafael yes let's see san rafael is in the building julia good evening we got jen campbell let's see paula's from sf who else is in the building michelle from santa rosa we got christy from san jose Yes, we got to see Christina Diaz, Sacramento, Deacon Dave, Deacon Dave, all the way from Sonoma. What's up, Deacon Dave? Teresa Santa Rosa, Cecil from San Mateo, Archdiocese of San Francisco, Chris Mariano in the building tonight. Yes, American Canyon Cat, Anti Cat, Anti Cat in the building, and Megan Teachin. Good evening. Welcome to joining us, Fort Bragg, San Bruno. Look at this. It's beautiful, beautiful time. And again, this is just our Zoom webinar, the typing in so if you are watching this on the live stream with youtube do me a favor again and type in there we have moderators checking out the chat so again if you are just joining us just let us know where you're tuning in from on this beautiful beautiful wednesday evening here for keep the light bright too we're gonna get started in just a moment get your pens out get your pencils out wait that's what i said get something to write on so that you can take notes tonight um, but more importantly, thank you for joining the conversation this evening. Greenville, South Carolina, Nancy McGrath. I am going to be in your region pretty soon. I will be in your region, Greenville, South Carolina. What a sign that is. Kathleen Caperson, awesome. Santa Rosa, also in the building. Beautiful, beautiful coast to coast. Steve Morris says, yes, we are coast to coast because why? Because the Holy Spirit is in the Wi-Fi, y'all. All right, so we're going to get ready in just another minute before we officially start. Keep the light bright, too. Thank you again for tuning in. It is great to see everybody in the chat. If I can do me a favor, just can I get an amen? Drop an amen in the chat, y'all. Come on, let's do this. Yeah. Amen. Remember, amen means I believe, y'all. And this is a, a beautiful night. And that's that's our goal tonight. It's just for our amen, our amens to be a little bit stronger. And more importantly, again, to just continue these powerful, powerful conversations that we're going to be having tonight. Yes, the Holy Spirit is in the building, is in the Wi-Fi. Like I, like I always like to say, the Holy Spirit is in the Wi-Fi. Awesome, awesome. There it is. Wow, beautiful. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I want to officially welcome each and every one of you to keep the light bright too. Now, before we begin, there is an official announcement because we want to make sure that we have the correct audience with us this evening. We know On Fire is a youth event, youth and young adults, but we do have a, a series there in a section for the chaperones, the parents, and the adults. So I want to go ahead and put this on the screen here just so that we're clear with who tonight's audience is. And I'm just going to read this verbatim. 
welcome. Our panelists will focus on the degradation of human dignity specific to an over-sexualized media. Don Johnson's documentary film, Unprotected, will provide a conversation guideline, including but not limited to topics such as sexting, birth control, abortion, and sexual revolution. Therefore, this webinar is designed for adults only. Students 14 and over may attend if accompanied by an adult. So again, this is a very important and much needed conversation to have um, in the church. And we just want to make sure that, again, this is part of the five part series for Keep the Light Bright on Fire, which will eventually is designed to lead to the on fire event in Vallejo. But again, tonight's conversations, tonight's topics are focused more for the parents and teens with their parents and youth leaders as well. So again, we want to thank you all for being with us this evening. So my name is Ryan Ramirez. Many know me as Bro Rai, coming at you from the Diocese of Sacramento. And I will be your host for this evening and the remaining three evenings. And we'll be sure to give you the information on those events. So tonight, on behalf of the hosting diocese, which is the Santa Rosa Diocese, we welcome you to keep the light right too, protecting the lives and the integrity, the lives of our young people with virtue and integrity. And again, this is a topic that is much needed. And so tonight, we have some very special panelists that will be joining the conversation, if not leading the conversation. We have Don Johnson, who is a filmmaker that made the film and the documentary Unprotected. We also have Myra Gonzalez with The Culture Project. Okay, with The Culture Project. And we did have Sue Wellen Browder on our schedule as well. There's a couple different technical difficulties, but let's keep her in our prayers in case she does show up on the panel um, for this evening. Oh, speaking of, <laughs> see, God answers prayer. Do me a favor. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit is here. Welcome, Sue Ellen Browder, um, again, author of Subverted and also an ex-editor for Cosmo. So <laughs> we are complete. She is here, y'all. So before we go ahead and do that again, we just want to take a moment and now we're going to just, I'm going to just give each of our panelists an opportunity to just share a little bit about themselves. So let's go ahead and start with Don. Hey, uh, thanks, Ryan. My name's Don. I am uh, primarily a father and husband, have four kids. I am a filmmaker. Uh, I like to write screenplays. I like to make documentaries. Um, like to tell stories, especially stories that I think are not well heard in the uh, in the culture. I like to uncover stories that maybe have been hidden. Um, so I, I do series like American Lies and that sort of thing. Um, but even beyond all of that, I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. I actually came into the church in 2015. And so that's been unbelievable. It's been amazing. Uh, you know, best thing I ever did, as you can imagine. Um, but so, yeah, that's that's me in a little nutshell. Awesome. Thank you, Myra. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good evening. It's so good to be here. What an honor to be a part of this amazing event tonight with such incredible people. Sue, it is so good to see you. Praise God that you were able to just hop on this call. Praise God. <laughs> Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm 25 years old, and as Bro Rai mentioned, um, I am a missionary for the Culture Project, and this is my second year serving with this, this amazing organization. Um, my first year, I was serving in the Archdiocese of, Diocese of Los Angeles, and this year, I'm serving in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, and who we are, the Culture Project, for those that are watching and are not familiar, um, we are a group of young people. Um, most of us are college graduates. Some of us have not completed college, but that's okay. Um, and we go out into the classrooms, middle schools, high schools, and universities, sharing the messages of sexual integrity, of human di dignity, reminding people who they are and what they were created for. And we also give a talk on social media and how it's morally neutral. It's either good or bad. What makes it good or bad is how we use it. And we give these young people practicals on how to use it well. Um, and for the good of society. So a little bit of background about how I got here. Um, uh, I was also cradle Catholic, um, but truly didn't have like my metanoia, like my conversion of heart till um, my first year after college. Um, I went to UC Santa Barbara and it was the summer of 2013 where I was really searching for truth and aching for, for God truly. And um, it was at a World Youth Day 
where I encountered God in the Eucharist, in the Mass. And so much has happened between 2013 to now, but praise God, I am here serving in this mission, and I'm just so grateful. So just a little bit about me. Awesome. And thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. And last, but certainly not least, Sue Ellen Browder, welcome. Um, our prayers were answered. So if you can just share a little bit um, about yourself with the rest of our audience out there in our Zoom webinar and Facebook. Okay, well, I'm a journalist. I went to the University of Missouri School of Journalism. I got a great degree, and then I immediately fell from grace when I left college and went to New York City and got a job at Cosmopolitan Magazine. And uh, that it was only after I became a Catholic that I began to look back because we made a lot, up a lot of those stories at Cosmo. Those were not real people that were having all these wonderful lives. They were made up. And after I became a Catholic in 2003, I began to look back and see all the damage that had caused in the culture. And of course, how did I become a Catholic? Well, I read the catechism. I was searching for truth. I was always searching for truth because as a journalist, you do hopefully look for the truth. And uh, I was looking for truth and I read the catechism and I, could, I couldn't put it down. I read it for three days straight. It was the most joyful thing I'd ever seen. And, and I gave up my whole career as a, as a journalist because I couldn't no longer do what I was doing. I was like Matthew, um, the, who was called, who was a tax collector, and he couldn't keep being a tax collector. I couldn't keep being a journalist the way I was. And so I became a Catholic writer. <laughs> amen. Amen. And thank you for, for being with us today. Yeah, drop the net and go. Follow me, Jesus says. So, so yeah, so we have an awesome evening prepared for you tonight. It is, again, a privilege and honor for me to even be part of this discussion. And so, again, this was this whole conversation was based around the documentary Unprotected. So we're going to go ahead and put a little clip just to kind of give you, uh, for me, when I first saw this opening clip, I mean, my instinct was like, oh, oh. it's tense. So check this out. I felt I couldn't really control what was going on anymore. And the, all the lights were dimmed all of a sudden. And I wasn't in possession of my actual body. Like, I couldn't or feel very much, and I was scared. So imagine just opening up to to that, and when I first saw that clip, was like, okay, this is gonna go deep. So, so now we have the creator, the one who's behind, who was inspired, Don Johnson. If you can, just take us back. Like, why this film? Why this topic? And what inspired you to create this documentary? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. So to give a little context for that clip, that's the opening clip uh, in the film. And it is a young lady who writes under a pseudonym, actually. She wrote a book about her experiment, uh, experience who was date raped in college. And she, she tells a story about uh, the hookup culture. And that's kind of how we open up the film. Um, she didn't want to be on camera. In fact, she wasn't sure she wanted to be in the movie. Uh, but I talked her into it. Uh, but the reason she didn't want to be on camera is she didn't want her dad to know what went on actually at college. And that really struck a nerve with me because the reason I ended up making this movie is I'm a dad. Uh, I've got three girls and a boy. And when my girls started becoming teenagers, I mean, when my oldest was getting 12, 13, I'll tell you what, Ryan, it was, it was more than I could handle, to be honest. The culture was so toxic the air that that my daughter's breathing we're you know my wife and i feel like are pretty protective parents but i realized that even as young as 12 13 14 as my daughters are, are going through these ages getting into 15 um the culture is dangerous it's physically psychologically emotionally spiritually dangerous for young women i mean we see one example of that with that first clip uh, stories of date rape sexual abuse harassment one of the biggest things in, in my community, and I found out not just my community, but everywhere, um, is sexting. Uh, two thirds of young girls, as young as 11, two thirds of young girls face pressure to send naked pictures of themselves to boys these days. And that that's what we were experiencing, even in my like middle class, supposedly safe 
um, culture, the, the, the girls were under a lot of pressure. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling very like protective of my kids and I, but I, yet at the same time, I'm feeling helpless because it's, it's just a dangerous place for them to live. But in trying to protect them, I realized that it, it's not just the type of people and events that we would normally look at as predators that are the problem, like the bully boyfriend or, you know, the slimy TV executive, like those people that are putting pressure on. It's not just those guys that are sexually objectifying my daughters. It's not just them that are the problem. More than that, and, and possibly even more sadly, it's the women that my daughters were supposed to look up to in this culture. Uh, the supposed heroes of female empowerment, right? Those women were telling my daughters mm -hmm. that they exist, that the meaning of their very lives is to be objects of sexual pleasure. Actually, just driving in this morning, right? I, I had an example of this. And, uh, you know, forgive me for listening to this music, music, but I try to keep up on what's happening. But um, one of the top artists today is Cardi B. And in August, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion came out with this song that shot immediately to number one. It actually set a record for most streams by any song in the first week of any billboard chart ever. And I can't even tell you the title of that song because it's so vulgar, but suffice it to say, it's a crass term for a part of the female anatomy. It, it goes by an acronym, WAP. And the entire song is about the mechanics of the sexual act. And it celebrates the fact that these women are there to provide the body to give men pleasure. And this is so crass and, um, sorry, that, that threw me off. Um, the, the refrain to that song is, there's some whores in this house. And they don't see it as a derogatory term. They just keep repeating, there's some whores in this house. Now, the artist, that that song came out that beat out for most streams in the first week is actually Ariana Grande, a woman who has made a career out of literally singing about only one thing, the mechanics of sex. Now she coincidentally actually just released an album two weeks ago and it's the number one song in the charts. It's currently still there. Um, it's called Positions. And I'll, I'll let you guess what kind of positions Ariana Grande is referring to. But this is the context that my girls are growing up in, right? The message that these performers are selling is this, that you are a piece of meat, that you are valuable in as much as you provide pleasure to men, and that you'll be happy if you do this. Like being a whore is something to strive for in these songs. And it's, and it's just like it's such a huge, huge lie, right? It's absolutely devastating to millions of young lives. But that was my starting point. I, I set out to find out like, how did we get here? Like, it, it hasn't always been like this. My, my mom didn't grow up in a situation where Cardi B is singing about being a whore, all right? Uh, it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't that. So where did we get these messages? Where did we get the idea that the meaning of life is mechanical, meaningless sex, that, that girls should strive to be used by men for physical pleasure? Like, where did that come from? And so I set out to research that. And actually what I uncovered was quite an amazing tale of intrigue and conspiracies and cover-ups and unintended consequences and, and a few heroes actually along the way standing up to the cultural tide and everybody laughed at them of course, but they turned out to be true. Uh, powerful corporations selling products they knew were dangerous. All of these crazy facts that I just, I just never knew. And so I thought one, people need to know this, right? Like this, people need to know this story. I was never told it. And two, this would make a great movie, right? I'm a, I'm a storyteller, I'm a filmmaker. I'm like, this is a great story. So we we set out to make that movie um, unprotected is, is what turned out. Wow. And so, and again, first, let me just take a moment to, to commend you for your level of awareness then, and even your level of awareness now. I think because of the culture that we're in, the fast paced culture that we're in, it's easy just to kind of bypass those things and not really pay attention to it. You know, you know, we see the smiles and the kids having fun. So it's kind of like, okay, it is what it is, but you actually had an awareness to, you know, be on top of this, but not just be on top of it, but to figure out like, how did we get here? Right. And that's something that I'm curious to know even a little bit more about. Like, so I heard the word research and game plan. And that's what I love about documentaries. This one specifically is that you like went deep. So if you could kind of take us like, so you had this idea, you figured out, I want to protect my daughters and, and other girls. And, and just, again, the lives of giving the virtue and their integrity. So what was kind of like your game plan uh, moving forward once you had the idea? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a reader, you know, I like to uh, I read and write books. And so uh, I started just researching, you know, went down the rabbit hole. Um, where did some of these ideas come from? It's kind of the same approach, frankly, I took to becoming Catholic. Um, the, the reason I became Catholic, I tell people I read my way into the Catholic Church, right? You just, you keep, you keep researching, you keep reading, you find out things that you were never taught, and you end up, you know, as long as you keep the truth in front of you, and like, I'm going to pursue the truth um, wherever it leads, even if it's uncomfortable, and frankly, like becoming Catholic was rather uncomfortable for me, <laughs> um, but you got to go down. So that, that's the approach I took to this. Um, just as a side note, Ryan, I, I want to thank you for um, just pointing out, like being aware um, as parents, as youth leaders, I mean, we've got to be aware of what your kids um, are, I mean, the, the nasty, nasty stuff that's on Instagram and on this, <laughs> I mean, even if it's not like this song that I'm talking about, the number one song this year, WAP, um, this song, you, you won't hear it probably necessarily on the radio, although there is a cleaned up version, but everybody knows it. Everybody's listening to it. TikTok is absolutely filled with it. So I'm just saying, like, please be aware this stuff's happening. But anyway, I mean, this is what I found. Um, it started out, you know, I, I dug into history and the 20th century was not, it was not exactly a time of contentment uh, on the planet, in, including in America. And if you, if you look over the history of the U.S. during the last 100, 120 years, you actually see a history of, of big ideas, sometimes um, promulgated like by famous people, like a particular spokesperson. But all of these ideas offer salvation of some kind, right? Like you can find happiness and contentment that you don't currently have if you do this. And so in the 20th century, you see at the beginning, you see the rise of nationalism, right? Like find salvation in your country or in blood and soil and in the really racist forms of it. Um, you see the rise of communism, like find salvation in economic equality. Uh, Post-World War II in America, you see the rise of consumerism as the salvation opportunity of the moment, right? Like buy stuff, achieve the American dream, get that house in the suburbs, get that Hoover vacuum cleaner and you will be happy. Like this is how you're gonna be saved. Um, but the thing is consumerism did not make everybody happy, uh, especially the women who were supposed to push that Hoover vacuum cleaner around uh, and you know, carry their kids off to school. I mean, it didn't provide happiness. And so in light of that, we actually saw a new ism or a couple of new isms arise offering salvation. And uh, I'll use the broad term feminism, but there was actually several different types of feminism. But even early on, and there's, and there's more types now, um, but even early on, you had a type of feminism that was pushed, I found out in my research, pushed most clearly by people like Betty Friedan, who believed that women could achieve happiness through work that if you could just get those jobs that men were having, that you would be content. And so Betty Friedan wrote, wrote a very famous book called The Feminine Mystique, sold millions of copies. Um, she became what's widely accepted as the mother of the women's movement. And so that was one kind of feminism, like uh, not, I mean, there was sort of a legitimate aspect to it, like women need equal rights, but there was also a salvific aspect to it where Friedan was looking for salvation in work it's one thing to have equal opportunity to work. It's another thing to have find salvation in your work. And that was what she was offering to women. Um, but that wasn't the only type of feminism. There was another type of as well, one that said that women could find happiness through promiscuous, commitment-free sex. And this was made most famous by a lady named Helen Gurley Brown who came out with a book in the early 60s called Sex and the Single Girl. Uh, she went on to become the editor of Cosmopolitan, made it the world's best-selling magazine, basically made it a sex manual for young women. But she was also selling this salvation message that you could find happiness and contentment by going and getting into bed with that married man down the street, right? Promiscuous free sex and a bit of hard work. She actually combined a little bit of Friedan, although Friedan, as Sue will tell you later, Friedan was not a fan um, of, of Helen Gurley Brown. But when these two movements, even though they didn't necessarily like each other, I realized that these two movements did have one thing in common and that was contraception and that they both and needed abortion. contraception to and make abortion. that work. And you abortion. Know? And the, the pregnancy, of course, if you think about it, pregnancy is the great deterrent to advancing both in the boardroom 
and the neighbor's bedroom, right? You, you're not going to do that if you think you or pregnancy is going to keep you from getting that high paying job. Bosses do not want to hire pregnant women. Um, but it's also going to keep you from having promiscuous sex. But at just at that time, uh, in, in, a, in a conspiracy that I'll put on very high, you know, satanic levels, um, the, the birth control pill came out. Yeah. And this enabled both of these movements to take off full, full speed, right? <laughs> I, yeah, and of course, are... this had all sorts of terrible consequences, sexual objectification of women, divorce, abortion, porn, the hookup culture. Um, and it did it almost right away. That's the crazy thing. Like you saw, you saw some of the negative consequences quite quickly, but yeah. how did it advance then? This is what sort of blew my mind. And this is when I was reading Sue's book that really this whole thing opened up and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a great movie. <laughs> um, it advanced through lies and propaganda. Uh, that that they they were able to sell this happiness, this salvation message, through the media, through magazines like Cosmo, and that's that's where my friend uh, Sue Ellen came into the story. Yes, and thank you. And again, as I was watching the documentary and just seeing the connections between the contraception and when all the rise of all these things started happening, it just started making you think more and more. You know, what was the bigger plan? So so we're gonna play a clip of the documentary with Sue on there. Like Friedan, Helen Gurley Brown was preaching a salvation message to women who had a problem they couldn't quite put their finger on. And when she became the editor at Cosmopolitan, that became the Bible of her crusade. The gist of Cosmo was hard work and sex without the kid will set you free. Formerly a literary publication, Brown turned it into a sex manual for young women, and it quickly became one of the world's best-selling magazines. Ooh, awesome. So before we invite Sue to share kind of her experience at Cosmo and just a little bit about her faith journey and the things that she's been up to, um, just to, for everyone watching, if you do have a question, because we know there's probably a lot of questions coming on, if you could put four question marks in front of your question and four question marks after, that'll make it easier for our moderators to field the questions and we'll do our best to try to answer those questions towards the end that haven't already been answered um, in our in our conversation. So again, four questions question marks before question and then four question marks after just so that we can see the questions whether you're watching from YouTube or the zoom webinar that'd be great so now I'd like to invite Sue cut to Sue Ellen Browder to kind of share a little bit about your experience at Cosmo okay well Cosmo is now just a metaphor for all of this stuff that's happening it was the first sex magazine for women in America, and it was very, very successful. And that is the thing that when Helen Gurley Brown turned Cosmo into a Playboy clone, because she actually went to Hugh Hefner at Playboy and got some of his writers and some of his agents, she wanted this to be a female Playboy. And we they even had a uh, centerfold of, of Burt Reynolds, and people may not remember that, but they actually had a centerfold at one point. When Cosmo became so successful, the, the uh, advertisers loved it. So this magazine, which just when the magazine became so successful, all the other women's magazines began to copy it in one form or another. It, it was money, 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 money. And, and there were things at Cosmo that were, we could never talk about. One was the uh, problems with the pill, you know, any side effects, you couldn't talk about that. You couldn't talk about uh, the negativity of abortion for women. All these articles were all made up. Kellen Gurley Brown even had a list of rules on how to make up stories about these women that were having these wonderful sex lives, but they weren't real. That they're still not real. When, when you see these, these women, so many times, even Helen Gurley Brown, when she was 72 years old, said it was no fun to wake up scared every morning. The, the very philosophy she's selling is a, a philosophy of fear, not joy, not joy. That's my, that's my message. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And it, and it, it kind of, you know, we think about fake news today and yeah. so it's not anything new. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I also noticed in the documentary were the statistics with the mindset when it came to women in fertility versus their careers. 
and how the more they wanted their career, the mindset of fertility or starting a family actually got lower. So speaking of fake news back then, and I'll be honest, I remember seeing Cosmo at, you know, the grocery store and it just catching my eye because there was a, a beautiful lady on there. And even though I didn't know what it was and I was so young, there was something intriguing about it for me to just kind of look through the magazine. Right. So as we think about kind of how all this is coming forward and where we are now um, and fake news isn't anything new. We talk about social media and and the way that we use filters and the way that we post things that aren't even real i remember i was scrolling through instagram and there was an app where you can actually put your take a picture of yourself and then it'll carve out like a six pack of abs for you <laughs> and and you can post that and it like creates the same skin tone same color so so with that the culture the culture that we're in today it doesn't sound like it's too far off from what it was even back then but speaking of culture we have another guest myra gonzalez who wants who's going to speak to a little bit about the culture, the hookup culture, um, being, you know, a young adult. And I would love for her to kind of share her experience with fake news, with social media and kind of the culture around these topics. Welcome, Myra. Thank you, Bro Rai. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I said this in the beginning, but I'm 25 years old. So I'm probably the same age as some of you watching. Um, and yeah, growing up in a culture, um, I, I can say that Seventeen Magazine and Cosmopolitan Magazine were definitely magazines that I purchased at a very young age. And it sells you a recipe for counterfeit love, a recipe for counterfeit truth. And we, it's enticing. And we as young women find those magazines glamorous. And many times we read these things and we're enticed. And we're like, if this is what Cosmo is selling, it, it might be like okay to try and, and, and say yes to, but then being part of this culture and to give you a little personal background, trying the culture and seeing it wanting and I wanting to find truth and, and I saw and I've sought love and been part of this hookup culture and in this culture that we feed in today uh, with the messages that we hear in the radio and what we see on billboards. Um, I remember trying these things and it was not a recipe for real happiness. It was a complete opposite. I was feeling empty, alone and depressed. And the reality is that if Cosmo or all these magazines were selling uh, what really mattered or really was true, then why is it that I was feeling all these, all these, em this emptiness inside truly? So a lot of like with this mission that I'm part of the culture project is truly an invitation to remind young people of who they are, but they can't, they don't know who they are until they know whose they are. And that's a big reason why I'm here today of uh, realizing that I am a beloved daughter of God. And I think that so many of these young people that I encounter in the classroom I just want to share a glory story, um, being part of this amazing mission. Um, I was giving a small group and in this small group, I was asking these young ladies, they were sophomores in high school. And I was asking them, what are the lies that you have believed? And a lot of them were saying, I feel like if what makes me beautiful is if I, if I have a perfect skin, if I have, if I'm a size zero in pants that no one will love me if I don't look like this person or this person on um, these uh, social media websites, whatever. And they're be believing and feeding into all these lies. And I said, ladies, all these things you shared with me are not true. And I started affirming their worth. Like you're good, you're beautiful. You're not the sum of your mistakes or weaknesses, all these things. And this girl that was sitting next to me was bawling. And at the end of my small group, I sat next to her and I asked her for her name. And she looks at me and says, Myra, when you said I was beautiful, that was the first time I've ever heard those words. Do you really believe that? And I said, I do. You are beautiful. And she gives me this huge hug. And she says, thank you for affirming my identity. I think what we're really seeking is for truth. But our culture bombards us with these lies day in and day out. And we believe them because they're so powerful. But God's words are, words are more powerful. And that's why I believe that the mission of the Culture Project is to really share the message of virtue of human dignity and remind young people of who they are and what they were created for. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And, um, and yeah, and I think that's it, right? We, we, we talk about identity, we talk about truth and I'm curious, Sue, after finding out about the fake news and thank you for those who are putting the questions in the Q and a, we do have a section for that. So, so Deacon Dave, I got you. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, Sue, like once you found out like this was fake news, like what was kind of your reaction, your mindset to it? Cause I remember you said like, I just, I got it. I can't do this. I'm out of here. Can you kind of take us through that process and, 
even like on a spiritual level for your own faith, like what, what did it take for you to just get up and leave? Because I think we all know what's right and what isn't. And we all know we're all in situations where we know we probably shouldn't be, but like, it's, it's different when, you know, uh, especially in big moves like yours, like with companies and organizations. So can you just take us through that process on what you did, Sue? It was a long process. Um, I was a freelance writer and I was writing at home. I was living a double life in my home at, with my beautiful family, my two children, my a wonderful man, wonderful husband. I was planting flowers. I was made, baking bread, baking chocolate chip cookies, living this beautiful life. And then I was writing all this malarkey, all these lies for Cosmo. There was a lot of con uh, conflict in me, but I didn't know where it was coming from a lot of anxiety, uh, depression, all of this, um, because you cannot betray the truth and still be happy inside all the time, right? Um, so it was when, when it, it took a long time because I kept telling myself, well, everybody's doing this, which, which everybody I knew was. You know, I knew a lot of writers who were doing this. I knew a writer from Time Magazine was writing this baloney for Cosmo. So there are a lot of people doing this. And I just said, well, nobody's going to believe it. It's just a bunch of malarkey. Nobody's going to believe it. But it was, as I say, it was only after I became Catholic and looked back on it. But when you tell lies, you're going to get caught. And at one point, I had an abortion. And that was the tour was was one of the well, obviously the stupidest thing I ever did in my life. And it was only after I became Catholic and was able to go to confession and get healed from that that I was able to face the lies I told, the you know, because it, you cannot face the truth if you don't have God's forgiveness. You just can't do it. You, 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 you'll, you'll find all sorts of excuses why you did that. But, but until God can forgive you and you know that you're loved, even when you did all of these horrible things, then, then you are set truly free. Amen. And uh, thank you. And we're going to pray for, for all those who struggle with abortion, um, those who've had it, those who might be considering it. So we'll make sure that we add it in our prayers when we do our rosaries. Um, and I think, you know, it goes to say, like, it was a buildup, right? There was a buildup. And I know Don mentioned earlier the statistics of, of sexting. And I'm just curious from Myra's perspective in, in the rooms, the classrooms that you visit or, you know, even in your own circles, I'm curious to that statistic because I, I think that that can kind of be kind of like the gateway to all the other stuff. It's like watching it and seeing it, you know, on, on social media or in a magazine and then, you know, receiving it on your phone or, you know, giving them on your phone. Like, I think and then it leads to the next thing, to the next thing. So, Myra, I'm just curious kind of. Um, what your thoughts are on that, uh, maybe in some of the experiences you've had with young young people in sexting? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, well, before I go into sharing a bit about my experience in the classroom, I, I want to share my own experience. Um, I want to just touch on Dawn. Um, Dawn, the reason why you created this film, um, I think is incredible. I think as a father, you care deeply for your children. And for all those watching, I know that you care so deeply for the young people that you're uh, discipling, ministering to. And that's why you're here to get informed and to share the truth with them. And I think growing up in a, in a Catholic household, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, my parents never had a talk with me about sex. Um, and I think it was something I never brought up because I was embarrassed. <laughs> growing up with two Hispanic parents, it was something that was never truly talked about in my home. And I remember at the age of 13, I was dating. I got in, in a relationship and um, it was not so long after dating this guy that he asked me for a sext. And I remember receiving this message and it, in a sense, breaking my heart that he would ask me for that. And I remember instead of going to my mom, who would probably tell me, no, that boy is not worthy of your heart. If you're going to send him any picture of anything, anything naked on your body, send a picture bare hand waving him goodbye, because that man is not deserving of you. <laughs> Instead of running to my mom, who is obviously 
my, my guardian, my, the best person to run to, I ran to my best friend in high school and I told her about this, this situation. And the first thing she says is Myra, he's your boyfriend. You love him. Don't you? He loves you. Send it girl. And what did I do that night? I went home and sent him a picture he never deserved. And for a few, high school, truly for three years, I struggled with an eating disorder and I truly struggled with depression and anxiety. And every time I looked at myself in the mirror, I didn't feel good. I didn't feel loved and I didn't feel beautiful because at the end of the day, we're not objects to be used, but people to be loved. And if I had heard at age 13 that I was worthy of so much more, if I had heard a talk on chastity, if I had someone to walk with me or my parents to tell me the truth about the issue of sexting, I probably wouldn't have sent that boy a sext. I wouldn't have. And I think that my 13 year old heart was aching for truth. And I encounter so many young girls in the classroom who have actually, this, was, this has also been their experience. I was giving a talk at an all girls high school in Los Angeles to 400 beautiful girls. And I shared my story about sexting with them. And at the end of the presentation, I had two girls crying in line waiting for me to talk to me. And they look at me and say, thank you so much for speaking up, speaking up about um, the issue of sexting. Myra, for the first time, I feel like I'm not alone in this and I can share my experience. And it was just such an impactful, impactful experience for me to see that these young girls were keeping this hidden because they were afraid. And I got to speak to them about, about God's mercy and love and the sacrament of reconciliation. And they said, we can start again, ladies, we can start again today. And um, it was just such a, a beautiful encounter. And the reality is when it comes to the statistic you asked, uh, Bro Rai, um, 17 Magazine actually interviewed 11,000 girls and 62% of them have reported that they have sent a sex. 62% of 11,000 girls that were interviewed and about 31% of teens think, think it's safe. So. Therefore, that's why the messages that we share in the Culture Project are so important because we, we remind these girls of the truth and the underlying issue of sexting, what it actually does. Because at the end of the day, I want to reiterate this line, we're not objects to be used, but people to be loved. And we get to remind young people of their worth, their dignity, and their goodness. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do me a favor. If you're watching this on the replay or even live and you got any value so far, just put the word value in the chat box, because I don't know about you at home. And again, I've had the pleasure in working with all of these panelists prior. And even till this day, I am still gaining so much more value um, and how powerful it could be just to sit with our young people and just let them know how beautiful they are inside and out. Right. And I think that again, the documentary Unprotected aims at taking us to how we got here, but also even pushing us forward on how we can protect the virtue and the integrity of our young people. So Don, I know you've you've kind of been listening in and you just want to get some of your thoughts before we uh, jump into some of the Q&A. And actually, there's another clip we want to share, um, Hugh Weiler, and I'd like you to set that up as well for us, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, so just a, a couple of thoughts. Um, before before we see that clip, as I'm listening to Myra speak, um, the just the idea here she is. She understands now that she has that Myra has two three years taken from taken from her teenage years where she's mired in depression. And I don't I don't know Myra if you would have been connecting that at the time to say maybe you would. I don't think that a lot of girls are. That's the thing, right? And not a lot of girls are making that connection. Yet teenage depression is absolutely through the roof. It's absolutely pandemic. <laughs> it is the worst thing happening to young people today. Teenage girls are absolutely depressed, yet they're not making the connection as to why. Why am I constantly uh, depressed and not feeling good? Well, they keep getting this message. This message are you're an object to be used and they're going through with it and it leads to nothing but pain uh, and problems. And so just to, to reiterate that the truth sets you free and making these connections, like it's, it's like we're doctors, you know, it's like you're sick because of this, stop ingesting, um, stop ingesting what's making you sick and you'll feel a lot better. Um, so I just I thought that was great. If we do want to set up the uh, the Jennifer Fulweiler clip. So one of the uh, aspects of contraception is that by its very nature, the separation of the sexual act 
from reproduction, from babies, separating sex from babies, mm -hmm. automatically, like in its nature, it changes what's going on, right? It changes what's going on in the sexual act. So uh, according to the design, God's design in nature, the sexual act is the ultimate act of self-giving, right? It's an act of love. And you define love, of course, um, as the act of giving of yourself to another. And so you have this full gift of love and, and that's what it's supposed to be. And the act of contraception deadens that right it stops that it's not no longer a full gift so it automatically in its in its very nature contraception turns the person into an object to be used and then we we go into that that's theology of the body stuff we go into that a little bit in the movie um but jen fowler a friend of mine um had this amazing experience where she's reading humani vitae and if of course if you haven't read humani vitae you should um amazing document came out in uh, 67 talking about the dangers of contraception and 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 paul the sixth when everybody's expecting you know oh the church is going to change his teaching he says no we are not going to change our teaching um and in fact if we if we were everything would fall apart and he prophesied a lot of the bad things but jen um is reading that document and, and we'll play the clip now and has this sort of epiphany which is pretty cool that reading this on human life encyclical and i had some women's magazines spread out in front of me and i realized that every single one had the word sexy somewhere on the cover sometimes more than once <laughs> all of these articles were how how to please men sexually how to be sexy the women were dressed you know unbelievably scantily clad you know showing off everything and i thought this isn't how my grandmother's dressed this isn't how my great grandmother's dressed this is not how women have ever been encouraged to dress in human history and i had always bought into these ideas that oh that's because women were repressed and you know, that's, it, it was an anti-woman thing that women didn't used to, you know, let it all hang out. And then I thought, you know, as a woman, I don't think I want to be told that wearing micro mini shorts in a, in a tube top is like how I should be dressing. Like, I wish the standard of style was frankly a little more forgiving. I thought this is actually very anti-woman, this, this new image of women where we all have to have perfect bodies with not a flaw on them and wear these fashions where everything is just hanging out all the time. And I thought, when did this style of dress change? When did it go from women dressing in a, a fashionable but dignified manner to having to look like stripper Barbie all the time? And I realized it was right around when our society accepted artificial contraception. And, and in Humana Vitae, Pope Paul VI predicted back in the 60s, he said, if we accept artificial contraception, men will start to look at women as objects. Women will start to feel pressure to make themselves objects for men. And I looked from that encyclical to the magazines on my bed, and I realized it happened. He was right. Ooh, so I'd like to actually turn it over to Sue and if you could just kind of share um, and each of the panels will have an opportunity to kind of share a little bit about that clip. So uh, we'll start with you, Sue, um, if you can share a little bit about is, that clip. He's absolutely right, of course. Uh, and, it, and I didn't pay any attention to Humane Vitae until after I became a Catholic in 2003. There was one thing that I've often, uh, I tell young women at, that at Cosmo, you could be anything you wanted to be. You could be a, you could be a stripper, you could be a, a, a doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be an engineer. But there were two things you could not be at Cosmo. You could not be a virgin and you could not be a mother. In other words, you couldn't be anything like the Our Lady, the mother of God. God was erased from, God was something that you was never, ever mentioned in Cosmo. And it's never, ever, he's a never, ever mentioned, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, never mentioned. But lots of astronomy, astrology uh, stuff, you know. So it's, it's all about magic. They've erased God and Our Lady from popular culture. She's, they're gone. They're gone. And, and that is why people are so miserable. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you've got all of these things going on inside you, believe me, I lived it. And when I came into the church and found out that God loves me, I've been joyful ever since. And that was 2003. And, and it doesn't go away. This is the answer. Live your life with, in, with the peace of God and it'll be new, all new. It doesn't matter. All, of the, all the junk you did before, forget it. It's over. God gives you a new life. It's a new life. Amen. That's, that's my message. <laughs> Amen. God's peace over world's peace any day. Myra, <laughs> your thoughts, Myra. Yeah. Oh, man. That, this, this documentary, for those who haven't watched the whole documentary, it's incredible. Please watch it on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's just so informative, and it really speaks to the truth of what our human heart, hearts are aching for, which is true and authentic love. That's the reality of every human heart. We're aching for true and authentic love love and who can feel that love not the world <laughs> not contraception <laughs> not the birth control pill um not a uh, premarital sex like all these things that the world says yes this will feed all your desires act on all the, your desires and it'll make you happy the reality is that you no know, we become a bondage uh, uh, uh excuse me a bond to our desires we become a slave to our desires and actually doesn't make us happy but when we allow god to be the dictator of all our desires and our desires for love is are good. Our desires for love are so good. But when we give them to God and we give him full control to take care of it all, oh my goodness, that, that's when we start experiencing real happiness, real joy, because he himself is love. So I think that, man, this message is so needed. And I think that at the end of the day, we cannot shy away from speaking truth. And it was really at the age of 18, where I heard my first chastity talk, a talk on purity. And it was the first time where I looked at this, uh, actually, I wanted to share, is that, it was actually at NorCal on fire. It was at on, on, fire, on a fire event where I heard, yeah, where I heard my first chastity talk. And it was at this event where I remember just, it was after um, letting go of this relationship in high school that I just felt so lost in. Um, and I was sitting in those pews with my youth group at that time. And I'm looking at this amazing women, probably a few years older than me. But she was filled, there was something special about her. She was filled with so much joy. And she literally just said, chastity is not about the, it, it doesn't look at your past. It looks at your right now and where it can go. And you have the ability to start over right now. And I remember looking at this woman and I started crying. And it was almost like the whole arena, like she was just looking at me. And it was like Christ in her. And I remember thinking to myself, I can choose to live a life of virtue right now. And God doesn't look at my past. He's looking right now at my present. And he's saying, Myra, I'm going to be with you. Just give me your desires. Give me your life. And we'll, I'll take care of it. And I'm not going to say it was perfect after that. Sure wasn't. I still made a lot of mistakes. But hey, I heard those words and they stayed with me. And man, we live in a culture that needs to hear the truth. And we can't shy away from the truth. So, yeah, those are my thoughts. <laughs> Thank and you. He is the truth. The he is the truth. Christ is truth in person. Yes. <laughs> Amen. And Don, any thoughts on this clip as well before we move to our Q&A portion? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to add to what uh, Sue and Myra just said, but, but, I mean, two things. The truth is what we're offering. The truth sets you free. And the world, that this is something I, I think even as, as Catholics, sometimes we get confused about. Like, we think that to be more appealing to the world, to sort of bring people in, we have to adjust to what the world is saying. Like, we have to just soften it a little bit. And it's actually just the opposite. Like, the world's message is destroying people. The world's message is evil, and it leads only to pain and suffering. <laughs> like, the message of Jesus is the one that brings the joy and and peace and this the, all the pain that people are experiencing the one the one thing jen did did say in that clip that it has always struck with me she she realized that these women magazines were 
preaching a very profoundly anti-woman message, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the thing, like this is very anti-woman and the world's message is it's just very anti-woman. It's anti-life, it's anti-love. It, it's anti, because it's satanic, I would say it's anti um, everything that God wants for us. And so as the Catholic church, we have the answer, right? Like we have the truth that sets you free. And if we just grabbed onto it and lived it out, um, man, how, you know, how could the world not be attracted to it? Um, I just, I just think it's such an, uh, you know, the, the, the message that we have, it's like, we have this, this amazing, powerful thing. And sometimes we're like tamping it down and I know like, this is, this is what people need. So yeah, it's hard to add to what Myra and Sue said. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. No, also I... anti-man. <laughs> the, the world is anti-man as well and anti-child. Oh, I mean, it's incredibly anti-child. So, I mean, that's yeah. it's yeah. chill and men too. And I, I, I keep asking like, when's the men's documentary come out? Yes, we'll, we'll get to it. But, um, and children, I mean, the children, the anti-children, like children are literally the enemy. Yeah. Like, children are the enemy that keeps you from being happy in our culture. Um, women are told that um, you need to be protected. Literally, that's what have have protected safe sex so that you protected from what from kids, right? Like kids are what's going to keep you from getting the money and the fame and the sex and all that stuff. I mean, such an evil message. And it's, a, you know, you wonder why kids are a mess. Kids are a mess these days. Yeah. Yeah, because they're they, they get that they they get that this culture looks at them as roadblocks to be overcome and that millions of their friends who could be here, like kids are smart enough to get this. Yeah. They, I could have millions of other friends that were <laughs> aborted um, because my parents decided to choose something else, right? So yeah, we, we just have such a profoundly beautiful, true message um, that the culture just so desperately needs right now. Yeah, I remember always hearing, you know, I would always say, yeah, you know, when I hear, uh, the idea about protection and I'm always like, well, there, it's not protecting your soul, <laughs> it's not protecting your spirit. Right. And, um, and yeah, and I think that the trend, right. Of not having, um, kids at an early age or waiting, right. Is a huge thing, which is why, again, the rise on, you know, and I, I'm, a, I'm an animal lover myself, y'all, but I'm just saying like a lot of people would rather have the, the animals than the babies. And, yeah, there's just so much going on there. And again, everyone's going to have their own story and their own reason. But I think, you know, what's important to know is that the messages, because here we have this history and this research and this beautiful, powerful documentary, and we have everything that's happening in today's world. And like, how do we bridge that gap? And I love kind of Wasu in our conversations prior to this, when she, you know, kind of you know, said what she said about Cosmo or leaving Cosmo. I said, well, what was Cosmo's response? And she said, nothing. No, no. <laughs> they said that I remember you sharing with me that they didn't even acknowledge you because they didn't want to even give it any light, which kind of leads into this Q&A, because I remember when Unprotected came out, um, there were um, announcements at our parish about the movie being um, available for only so many days. If people don't show up, they're going to pull it from the movie theaters and just all this this stuff about trying to get as much people there because it wasn't. You know, again, it wasn't being promoted like most movies. So um, Deacon Dave has a question for you, Don. It says, what have you seen as the impact of Protected? What has been the response? Um, and is this movie still making rounds? Um, yeah, so I'll answer the last question first. It absolutely is. We, we get thousands of people watching it every week on uh, Amazon Prime, on Formed, which is a wonderful Catholic resource. Um, you can buy the DVD. Uh, on Amazon or from Ignatius Press or from me directly, donjohnsonministries.org. Um, so yes, absolutely um, available and and people are watching it. The impact, like how how is it received? And again, I go back to that truth setting you free. Um, it's interesting. It depends sort of on the age group because it, it impacts um, different, and I'll focus more on, on the women I think than the men, because that's sort of been the most powerful to me. Um, one of the first, in fact, the first theater showing we had, and it, it, it repeated itself over, but the first theater showing we had actually in the Bay Area, um, uh, after the, the show, um, some ladies came out and they were probably in their you know late 50s, 60s, just bawling. I mean, just crying their eyes out. And um, again, this is basically happened every time, but. Uh, 
after we had kind of set aside and I, I talked to them and she just, she wanted to share with me a little bit. And she shared that she was, um, she had taken her friend to the abortion clinic. She had lived through the sixties. She had been there with the women's movement and she had taken her friend and she had carried, she had carried that guilt around, even as not, 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 you know, think about the women who've had the abortions, obviously they're carrying this guilt around, but even this friend had carried this guilt around all these years. But yet the movie, she had like, it had lifted something off because she realized we were lied to. Like it was a, it was a very professionally done, billions of dollars have been poured into making sure that you believe this lie. And this is freeing to, to people to realize that there are people, I, I mean, it sounds weird, but the fact that there are people actively working to lie to you and sell you something actually is sort of freeing. Like, oh, so it's not, it's not entirely my fault, right? Like I, I, I've been fed this propaganda yeah. and it was just so freeing. And I've had that so many times that women who lived through the sexual revolution and have been carrying pain around for decades. Um, they didn't know the backstory. They didn't know the millions of dollars that were spent lying to them. They didn't know all the bad science. They didn't know all the, the big pharma, what they had done, what big media had done. So there's that to that to that sort of age group where people have a lot of like freedom now realizing all the work that went into that. But then there's like the middle, uh, I would say like a middle age where you have women who have chased after the careers and they've put off marriage and they've put off childbearing and they're too just under a lot of pressure i mean ivf is through the roof you know there's, there's that that um sort of sad career woman stage we talk about in the movie a little bit and and again there's it's a freeing for them too there's also a sadness that they've sort of they've missed out now and they realize but but it's it's an explanation to all of these age groups it's an explanation like Oh, that makes sense. But then there's also, um, I would say with that age group down, there's like, man, I wish I had known this when I was 19, or I wish I had known this when I was 18, because <laughs> that would have saved me a lot of heartache. And that's what I, one of the best thing, I mean, that's all great, but to the high schoolers, right? You high schoolers who watch this, um, I've heard from so many, they're like, oh man, that, I did not know that. That is, that's unbelievable. <laughs> Thank God that I no longer have, I don't have to go down that path. And like Myra was talking about, even just knowing that one or two other people out there realize that they're with you, like it's it feels lonely, you know. Like it, even as a filmmaker, um, and I, you know, I I know people like Sue Browder. Like <laughs> I get I get that there's people out there fighting the battle, but it gets lonely in this culture because we're so inundated with lies. It's just so strong. Exactly. Um, and, and so just for these girls to know, and boys too, obviously, but we've really been sort of focusing, the high school girls to know you're not alone. There's people like Myra, there's people like, like, you know, maybe your dad or your mom, actually, maybe they know a little bit, you know? Um, so that, that's, quite, that's been the, re the, re the response. And I'm curious, Don, there was a question around the age appropriateness, like what age um, did you design or create this you know, movie for? Or what would be the age appropriate to start watching this film? Yeah, we've had that discussion. We had it at the premiere. I remember for those of you, probably there's a few of you watching who were at the premiere. We had this very discussion. Um, and we've sort of we sort of landed on, listen, the, the, the culture is so sexualized and kids are so inundated um, that your junior hires are going to, you know, they're not learning anything new about sex with this thing unless they're, you know, <laughs> so we've, I've been fine telling, you know, parent, parent supervision, of course, but junior high and up, I think in this culture is totally totally fine yeah is, is yeah, absolutely. yeah uh thank you and then we have a question from an anonymous attendee thank you anonymous uh for sue and sue the question is if you could give a piece of advice for young women what would it be and anonymous also says they're a huge fan of your book subverted so thank you and they say thank you so again what piece of advice would you give for young women i would say um realize that God is with you and that do not listen to the culture and all turn off the television, turn off the internet, stop looking at the, at the uh, cell phone and find your real life because your life is very important and your, what you do with your body affects your soul and what you do with your soul affects your body. Your body and soul are one. Once you realize that, 
you will begin to be free. Mm, thank you. So yeah, <laughs> look at Myra in the back, snap, snap. <laughs> Um, and, and I do want to just throw this out there because I know you had mentioned earlier, like, where is the version for the fellas, for the guys? And I and I do want to, you know, put out there re representing, you know, the males here that there is definitely um, pressure as well. Like I had mentioned the Instagram, uh, you know, what's it called? The, uh, the Instagram commercial on how, like how to put abs on yourself and all those other things. So. It definitely is the same for for me anyways in the growing up on you know um, having to look a certain way to attract a certain girl right and all those other things and the pressure right i think that's kind of the underlying thing the pressure of being right or fitting in you know and again it's just us forgetting that we are enough it's us forgetting that you know whose we are right and i think that's something that i just wanted to throw out there because i know again this is this unprotected was definitely filmed with uh, uh, Don's daughters in mind and all women around the world, but also just kind of representing for the fellas out there and the brothers that, you know, we definitely feel um, similar pressures, similar pressures in terms of how we um, show up and how we show out. So I would, I mean, just to build on that, Ryan, I'm, uh, a lot of people watch the, interestingly, and I would encourage everyone actually uh, to go to Amazon, not just for selfish purposes, but to get the movie out there a little bit. And if you like the movie, um, please review it, give it, because it's, because basically what happens with the film is you either get five stars or you get one star. And the one star um, comes from inevitably, uh, you can go and actually look for yourself and you tell me if there's a one star there that doesn't come from a very, very angry person who has had a lot of pain, has probably had a broken family, several instances of you name it, they've been through it. And here's the thing, to look back, it's, it's very painful to look back on your life and to think that, wow, I've been lied to and I went along with that all that time. To, if you don't accept the freedom, I, I mean, that's what Jesus sort of dealt with in his ministry. Like a lot of people just rejected, rejected Jesus, but that's like they're rejecting like the message. They can't, if, if, I, if I accept this message, and so they get very angry. Anyway, all that to say, one of the big things that, from the angry reviewers is they say it's misogynist. Like they say that this is blaming women for their problems and that men get off scot-free and of course it's not i mean i think any honest you know viewing of the film we're, we're not blaming women at all we're saying that women have been lied to um including sometimes by themselves but um to the men though right because it's not misogynist but the men do sort of i mean the men now with the sexual revolution they were told by women often, um, financed by men, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of male money behind the pill and behind Cosmo, Sue knows this, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> a lot of male money financed this, there was a lot of women out front. Um, but the men, if you, if, if you tell a guy, I mean, you tell a guy, listen, you can have all the commitment-free sex you want and you don't have to get married and you don't have to settle down, I mean, what happens to guys? They take the free sex and they don't settle down a lot of times and they sort of just roll with it. And now, and, and maybe Myra can back me up on this, but I've, I've talked to a lot of 25 year old women, frankly, and uh, one of the biggest problems with um, that age group, say you're 20 to 30 year old uh, Catholic woman, is that there's a, not a lot of great guys available right now. That they don't want to get married, that they're not, they're not willing to settle down and have kids, even to girls who want it. Like you're like, please, you know. And and why is that? Well, it's a, it's a, it's because of the sexual revolution, right? We've told men the same thing, that no, I mean, we you, you don't settle down, you don't take responsibility for a family, you don't have a bunch of kids, uh, you got to wait till you're, you know, till the girl is thirty or forty or whatever and has the career and the money. And well, by you know, guys are not. They're not going to go with that. I, I know, I mean, personally, I, I have very close friends who um, are in, in that like 40 year old age and would love to get married and would love to have kids. Mm -hmm. And they cannot get, even at that age, they cannot get the guy to stop playing video games long enough to say he, he's like, I'm not going to give up my guy. Like literally, I, and you're like, this is yeah. so false, right? It's so wrong. So there's a there is a there is a big guy element to it, Ryan. I just wanted to throw that no, out there. Like no, no, guys no. guys don't get off the hook on this one. Uh, you just have to look at it from exactly. that angle. 
Thank you. And then Myra, if we can, um, just a question for you, Myra. Two questions, actually. So first question is the same question to Sue. Um, what would be your message to a young woman, junior high, high school, maybe even young adult right now, uh, watching this video, watching it live or on the replay? And then the second question is right on the screen. Like, where do we go from here? Thinking of practical steps for the, our parents, for our youth leaders out there, for adults wanting to have this conversation again, because we've had a lot of great content and now it's like, what do we do with it? There's always the, the call to action. So if you can answer that, those those two questions, your message directly to the young woman or a young man who's watching this video right now or watching you live or on the replay. And then where do we go from here? Yeah, when thank you. Um, those are great questions. First, um, Don, you said something um, that kind of stuck with me about um, talking to the perspective of masculinity, the men. Um, there's this quote by Fulton uh, Sheen <laughs> that I love so much. And I'm going to read it just because I think it's very, this is like my tip of advice <laughs> for these young girls watching and for everyone watching. Um, to a great extent, the level of any civilization is a level of its womanhood. When a man loves a woman, he has to become worthy of her. The higher her virtue, the more noble, noble her character, the more devout she is to truth, justice, goodness, the more a man has to aspire to be worthy of her. The history of its civilization could actually be written in terms of the level of its women. Remember whose you are. And I think at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm on this panel and I would be lying to you if I said I was perfect. <laughs> no, I'm not perfect. I'm so far from it. Chastity and virtue is a choice every single day I have to make. I wake up in the morning. I'm like, okay, God, today I'm choosing to do good because I love you and I love me and I love my brother in Christ. And I love my sister in Christ. And I'm going to choose you today to put you first, put God first. Uh, my mom passed away three years ago, but that was honestly her, her advice to me always is Myra, put God first, everything will follow. And I, a practical, I want to just leave um, for those watching, um, practically speaking, um, how to share this message with the young people. Speak with love and compassion, but never shy away from the truth, which Sue says, so God is truth. Never shy away from the truth. Um, I think pract practically speaking as well, I think having these ongoing conversations is crucial, walking with them. It's not just a one done conversation deal. Like we'll just have one conversation about it and then we're good. It's an ongoing conversation. It's a truly not only encountering, but walking with these young people on a daily basis and truly um, prayer as, as leaders, as youth ministers, um, myself as a missionary, I can't do any of the work that I'm doing if I'm not myself rooted in Christ and I need to be rooted in Christ. Pray, 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 pray without ceasing. Um, that would be my practicals for you. Um, and last thought, I think it's very important to remind the young people that if they're trying to live out a life of virtue, they need to be surrounded by people who believe the same thing, accountability. It is so hard to really live out this message when we're, when we feel alone, when we're like, oh, I'm the only one that truly like believes this surround yourself by people who are also striving to striving to live out virtue. And I promise you, it's not only easier, but the more that we apply it, it becomes part of who we are. It becomes a part of our day and day in and day out. So those are my practicals for you. Awesome. So just to recap that speak <laughs> the truth with love, put God first, pray unceasingly and environment, right? Like the saying goes, it's not the seed's fault if it doesn't grow. So putting yourself in the right environment is key. I um, mean, again, so we're going to go and ask, we're going to take this question to Sue, our Sue's final thoughts and some of your practical advice. Again, keeping in mind our our parents and our youth leaders here that are watching. And I'll just read this. Where do we go from here? Protecting our children from social media seems impossible. Preparing um, verse, versus sheltering seems prudent. How do we prepare them to combat clickbait and prevent the inevitable mental health issues? How do we focus on the truth, beauty, and goodness God has built within each of them? Well, of course, every family has to be a little church. You know, the praying and, and reading scripture every evening going to church regularly. This will protect you. But also, 
why not set 10 young ladies getting together and reading and watching this film together and then talking about it and then spreading it around to their other friends and say, oh, you've got to see this movie. Let's, let's, let's all get together. We, when here, I'm here in Wyoming Catholic College. Oh, by the way, as, a, as parents, get your child, your daughter and your son into a good Catholic college very important because they'll be surrounded by friends who are like them and we've got like uh 10 young ladies that i i wrote another book called sex and the catholic feminist and they they all they they got together and said we're and we're, we're we talk about it we talk about it and and then we talk about sex all the time but but we get there's 10 of us that get together and talk about this. It's very good. Get your friends together. Watch that film. Um, you know, spread the word. You know, don't stay. Don't stay quiet. <laughs> Amen. And so my takeaways from that, again, as you're sharing this is domestic church. Continue to build that domestic church daily. Um, small communities, um, really build that small community and then, you know, bring it from the inside out and be contagious. Luke 12, 49, Jesus came to set the earth on fire and how he wished it were already blazing. So yes, beautiful takeaways. And then if we can bring it over to Don, some of your practical, practical tips and ways, you know, where we can start now for those um, that are just watching this, um, watching our evening tonight. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that you put that it's inevitable that the kids are going to get that uh, on their social media. However, I would say, um, on one hand, I agree with that. They're going to, but you, they're going to get it. On the other hand, as parents, we don't have to just give it to them. All right, so we don't have. They don't have to have a phone. Uh, they don't have to have full access to all internet. Um, I personally. Um, do give the kids a phone, but at a certain age when they get old enough and never alone in their bed, and I've got software that tells me exactly what they're looking at each day. Um, now, I personally, I'll be honest, I, I shared this with the panelists. I, I had a hard time with my oldest daughter um, as a teenager, just talking about some of the stuff, you know, and it, it's sometimes very hard <laughs> as a parent to talk. But um, I don't know if we don't maybe we, we don't all necessarily communicate the same way. And so as I as I shared with you guys, I actually I literally it wasn't just a, a, a plot twist. I literally made the movie so my kids would watch it. Like if I, I know I didn't if I didn't have my daughter going through what she did, the movie would not have been made. Interestingly, um, she she watched the movie and it did help. Like it did actually help. Um, with our relationship, with her view of, of sex and all the rest of it. So I do think we got to be aware of what they're seeing, but also controlling it. And at the same time, um, I know that maybe some of you are, are, are a bit surprised that I know, uh, you know, about WAP and Cardi B and, and all these things. Now, you, I think I feel like you got to know that stuff. And that the fact that my kids know that I know the lyrics to the most popular streamed songs um i think helps a lot with them so it's now i listen and, and if i it's nasty out there but i know it's nasty and they know that i know that it's nasty and so it's almost like we can kind of like i'll watch TikTok. we actually have a time with, so with my middle daughter she's now she just turned 16. we actually look at TikTok together at nights mm -hmm. um now i don't listen i don't recommend that i got a lot of filters and stuff on but some and sometimes there's some nasty stuff that comes through there but at the same time, us watching it together and me being able to interact with her, like she knows where I'm at, you know, and so, Amen. so there's that. And then finally, listen, I got to I got to shout out to what both of you, everybody has said. And also, um, also um, in the uh, in the comments, I saw my friend Sheila point this out, and I think this is excellent. So I want to make sure everybody on video gets this. Um, sometimes the church, we feel like we're our own worst enemy because we're scared of the truth a little bit, right? Like sometimes we're scared of the idea that the church teaches against contraception or same sex stuff or all that. Like, no, the church's teaching is not there to hurt anybody. The church's teaching is the truth and the truth leads to freedom and joy and happiness we have that by not by hiding it under a bushel by not sharing it with people um, we are doing them a big disservice and we're really hurting 
hurting ourselves in the process. So, um, so sometimes getting this movie out, um, even even some dioceses, like I'm so happy for the Diocese of Santa Rosa that they're promoting this awesome, you know, not every diocese would do this. <laughs> So there, there is that, like the truth will set you free, ladies and gentlemen. We live in an, in an area of, in, in an era of lies, like lies, lies, lies everywhere. Um, stick close to the truth and, and don't be afraid of it. Amen. Amen. So my, my takeaways, bro, rise takeaways from your uh, sharing was number one, borders, I mean, not borders, boundaries, set the boundaries um, with our young people. And I think it's really important to set them with them so that there is a level of agreement there, but set the boundaries. Number two, um, I thought about fortitude and not necessarily having the courage, but more of the fortitude and staying in the battle to have those difficult conversations. And back to what Myra said, speaking that truth with love. And the other piece I got from you was be present. They know that you know means that you are present in their life. And I think that is so important, especially now how busy we are your presence is the best present so being present to that knowing that you know that you know what's going on um and then truth coming back to truth i think that not veering away from it again is really really important so again a lot of value here everyone um to all the panelists i just want to take this moment again this is a collaborative effort um, before we get ready to um, shout everyone out, we're going to put here on the screen ways that you can stay connected. Okay, so if you see here, if you choose to watch this documentary, Unprotected, which is available on Formed and Amazon Prime, please note that the topics covered tonight are explored in greater detail and may not be suitable for your child. So again, just keeping in mind those age appropriate age restrictions there. So we have Unprotected there. We have the book uh, by Sue Ellen Browder, Subverted, and then we have The Culture Project. So um, again, please stay connected with, with everyone. And I do want to just, again, highlight that Keep the Light Bright is, again, is an on-fire movement uh, every year in Vallejo, California, in my hometown. Whoop, whoop, we have at Discovery Kingdom thousands of teens on fire for Christ. And we have talks. We have music, present worship, adoration, you name it. And we have workshops for the adults. So this is the second Keep the Light Bright. Okay, so we have five total. So the next one is going to be coming up pretty soon. But I want to shout out again, the Diocese of Santa Rosa is hosting tonight's event. The last event was the Archdiocese of San Francisco. And we also have the Diocese of Sacramento, Reno, Fresno and San Jose. So this is definitely a collaborative effort to speak the truth boldly. Um, so I just want to presence all of those who participated. Um, and at this moment, I do want to thank all of our panelists um, tonight for just being in the conversation. Thank you for those who are still on with us or if you're watching the replay. Matter of fact, if you could, if you're watching on the Zoom webinar or on YouTube, if you can just put one word that describes your feeling right now after this beautiful, fruitful conversation, if you can just type in one word in the chat, um, something that is just is resonating with you right now, or it could be a few words if it's more than that, um, just to kind of show a little bit of gratitude to our panelists. Um, but yes, we are going to go ahead and now put up our next event. Okay, our next slide, our next event is going to be Jan in January 2021. So check it out. We have... Okay, now this one is for, again, all of our youth, young adults, and parents are invited as well. And this is called Rise Up Young Church, being hosted by the Diocese of Reno with special guest Mark Hart. Okay, and of course, yours truly will be there um, hosting the event again, just to keep continuity there. But this is our next event. So mark your calendars, January 2016, uh, 2021. Let's start the year off right, because now is the time to rise. Right. Rise, meaning um, faith, faith. Yeah, to, rise, to rise up. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and again, thank you, panelists. I'm going to invite our director from the Santa Rosa Diocese to close us off in a closing prayer. And again, thank you, Sue Ellen, Myra and Don. Um, watch the movie, read the books, connect with the Culture Project. I tell you what, this is the time. This is the time. So thank you all again. Thank you all. Thank you all for, for watching and listening. Thank you, Bro Rye, Don, Myra, Sue. Uh, truly the Holy Spirit present tonight. So let's call down the Holy Spirit, especially in this time of chaos and confusion, uh, for clarity 
and uh, renew our efforts of purpose in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We ask for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, just like you brought Sue to us tonight. We ask for clarity of when we need the right words to be able to encourage our fellow partner in ministry, our fellow parent, or encourage our young people that we know we know they're suffering, Lord. They are trapped. They are trapped in the upper room. And only the comfort and guidance and courage of the Holy Mary Virgin Mother can walk into that upper room and break those locks and say, we got you. And so we're thankful that, that you've given us that Heavenly Mother and her courage and strength. And we ask for continued outpouring of the, of the Holy Spirit's wisdom and kindness in those conversations that will be awkward, but we know you got us. And so finally, Lord, give us that courage when we have those awkward conversations to just to rep you and, and understand that it might be an unpopular opinion, but it is truth. And that truth will speak to heart. And so whatever heart we're talking to, we ask that you open up that heart and open up that mind so that we may be a vessel a prism of your truth, beauty, and goodness. And we give you thanks for, for technology to bring us all here together tonight. And for whatever comes from this night, we ask that you just give it that, uh, that strength that only you can. It's not us. We are limited. It is only your strength. We pray all these things in your son's name, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Have a good evening. Take care, everybody. God bless you all. And we are out of here. Keep the light bright, too. It's officially over. Have a great rest of your evening. Pray for us because we'll always be praying for you. See you at Keep the Light Bright 3. Peace.